afternoon, everyone. Afternoon. <coughs> Sorry, I sang myself hoarse during worship, so I'm going to need my water. <coughs> <coughs> I think you all read the Bible horse as well, right? <laughs> Very long passage of scripture today. This so is what happens when you only get me for one week. I've got to take four weeks of content and put it into one week. <laughs> Alright, it's really great to be back here at GSKL. It's such a, a privilege to be able to, to share with you the word. Um, and um, to, especially to uh, on an occasion like today, uh, many of you all know that uh, today is a very important milestone for GSKL. Right? This marks the last service we have here in Viva Home. Viva Home has been our home for the last six and a half years. And this, this premise has been our home for the last three years. Right? And I don't know if you all remember, some of you might remember this, but if you all were at the service three years ago in the old place in Viva Home, on the other block, I also had the privilege of preaching the last sermon there. So I see that I've got an anointing to close things down. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's make sure that this is a memorable one. <laughs> Alright. I'm going to miss this place. I think many of us are going to miss this place. Right? It's been the place that we've been gathering with so many familiar faces every week. We can encounter the presence and the love of God in time of worship. It's a place where we've learned about God's love for each and every one of us and who we are in God. It's a place where so many of us have found safety in a home where we could be ourselves. Had many, I remember having many meals here, uh, many shared laughter and many shared tears. Right, so a lot of memories here. Uh, I, I caught up with uh, Anthony and Jason yesterday, uh, and. Um, uh, he reminded me of a moment that uh, I wanted to share with you all one moment from the last three years here. Uh, can you all uh, what is the most significant moment for you all here in the last three years? Maybe you've got different ones. Uh, but for me, it was this incident. This one. Uh... It was two years ago. Um, and the reason why it was so memorable was because I can remember the carpet having graf the confetti for the next two months after that. <laughs> because it was so sticky, it stuck to the carpet. Yeah. You all remember that? Yeah. Every year we vacuum, vacuum, vacuum. <laughs> <laughs> Who did that, the confetti? Calvin. Calvin. <laughs> so, you know, this has been our home. And just like the, 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 the passage of scripture that we have just read, this has been the place that we met. This is our upper room. You know, I had a, some of y'all in uh, went to Israel um, in December, right? And uh, y'all had a chance to uh, see this place. This place was the upper room where pe they thought that the disciples originally met in. This was the disciples' upper room. In a passage of scripture that we read from Acts chapter 1 and 2, it's situated and located inside here. Uh, boss, we think that is uh, here where the, the disciples met. And so this is the place where we meet, and this is our upper room. And some of us are wondering, like the disciples wondering at that point in time, what is next for GSKL as we leave this place? So you all know that we are going to go about 10 minutes down the road into a temporary home, but that's only just going to be for a few months, right? It's not going to be our final destination. So many of you are asking, what is this future going to be like for GSKL? So I thought it was very important, you know, in today's sermon that we really try and understand and discern and prepare for the next few months ahead. How God is going to be speaking to us as a church and as a community. And I want us to be encouraged by the journey that the disciples took in their own journey, leaving the upper room as well. They were facing a similar situation. You know, Jesus had ascended and they are ready to you know, get on board in a brand new situ situation. They had no leader. They were wondering what to do with their lives. They are wondering how they're going to continue what God is calling them to do. And so the 11 disciples gathered in the upper room. This belonged to one of the houses of one of the disciples. They came together as, a, as the group 
you know, who in the past used to do life together with their leader called Jesus. They gathered together to support one another. They were religious outcasts. You know, during that time, this was just a movement that was just getting started. They believed in a faith and believed in a God that the majority of the people around them didn't believe. It was a different understanding of this, this God that, the, that has been revealed through Jesus Christ. And very similarly, GSKL also finds ourselves in a place where we are saying that we are an open and affirming congregation. We believe we are the religious outcasts in our times. We believe things that are a little bit different from what are the churches that are around us. And so we have a lot to learn and we've got a lot of similarities with the early disciples. We are in very good company. So in the, in the passage of scripture, I want to unpack it for you and today so we can learn from their journey and what does it speak to us in our journey as we prepare for the next few months ahead but before we do that can we join our hearts and just give this time to god in prayer dear god we thank you for gskl we thank you for this place where we can meet in for the last three years and the six and a half that we've been here in viva home god we have seen you work your miracles we have seen you pour out your love we have seen you change the hearts of so many people we have seen you be the pillar of light that has guided our way but god we are now going to a situation where your people are going to go into a new season we're going to be starting a new chapter and god please give us the assurance in and through this word that you will go with us God, give us assurance in this time of where we open up our hearts to you that, you are, uh, that we have begin to discern what you're calling us as a community to embark on in the weeks and the months and the years ahead as we put plans together. God, help us to be able to have the courage to step out of our comfort zones, to not just look backwards at what we are leaving behind, but look forward at what you're going to be doing in and through the life of this community. We give this time to you. We thank you for each and every person here that calls GSKL their church and their, it calls you their, their Lord and Savior. We give this time to you and we make this prayer in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 So what are the things that they do? What can we learn from the journey of the disciples as they were leaving the upper room? The first thing that we want to, I want to encourage you around that. So this was a picture of what they looked like could be around like what they were doing in the upper room. So what are the things that they, that they did? The first thing that we, we learned from scripture was they continued to meet as a community to pray and to discern. They continued to meet as a community to pray and discern. There was a temptation there that they would start to scatter. They would go their own ways. You know, and the Bible, the, the passage of scripture said that the apostles returned from Jerusalem and when they arrived, they went upstairs in the room they were staying and those present were those people and they all joined together, verse 14, constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with their brothers. They came together constantly to pray. And the first thing that I want to, that to, to note is that when Jesus left them, you know, in many churches, when a leader leaves, there's a temptation to go and try and follow the leader, or try and find a new leader. But this is not what the, they did. What they, they did here was that they continued to gather together as the same community. They knew that even though Jesus was gone, the one that they had been with for the last two and a half years was gone, they were still going to meet together. But they were going to not just come to, and say that, oh my goodness, my leader, the teacher, the person who is going to give me my spiritual feeding is gone. I'm not going to come anymore to be part of this community. No, they continue to meet, to fellowship, and to pray. And then they also wanted to, they, um, they focused their time in terms of praying together. You know, see, you can see here, they all join together constantly in prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brothers. They all came together uh, to pray. So here is my, ch uh, my challenge to each and every one of us. When we are thinking about the next step of the journey, and the first step, when we're starting to think about leaving this upper room, will you 
stop coming to GSKL because it's further? Will you stop coming to GSKL because the people might be changing? Will you stop coming to, uh, to GSKL because you know, it's not uh, the same place that you have, been, you have been meeting in for the last six and a half years? And when we come together, are we going to be praying regularly? Are we going to be coming together to discern the season that we are in? Because the, what God wants to do in and through this community, only this community can discern for itself. It is not Gary's idea, Pastor Joe's idea, somebody else's idea. It is the collective will of this community coming together to go after and understand the will of God. Okay, so it's very important to come together to pray over the next few months that you're in the temporary location. And this means coming together, not one person pray and then everybody, yeah, 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 follow, follow, follow. But it's to all lean in and everybody come together to pray together. So that's number one. They continue to meet together as a community to pray and to discern. The second thing that they did was that they raised up and they recognized new leaders. They raised up and they recognized new, new leaders. So we read in Acts chapter uh, 20, uh, uh, Acts chapter 1 verse 20 to 26, that there was a person who was used to be part of the community, his name was Judas, right? And so they needed one new person who was going to be the apostle, a messenger, uh, to replace um, uh, Judas, right? So what did they do? They got together two people who qualified for that, which was um, uh, Joseph as well as Matthias, right? And then in the end, they made a decision to choose Matthias to be that role of the apostle to replace Judas. So the question here that I have with uh, for, for us, right, is that are we actually creating an, a culture that we are developing new leaders? And I think that one of the big issues that I see in GSKL is that many times a few people carry a lot of weight of ministry here. A few people are, 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 are think that they have got to carry and be responsible for everything that's going on. But Peter recognized that there was a requirement for succession. He needed to understood the requirements for the ministry. And in this particular case, we're trying to re replace the role of the apostle, the messenger, who, the person who will go forth and carry Christ's message of God's mission into the world. And so they, made a uh, they chose the uh, people based on the criteria of one who had interaction with Jesus uh, over the last two years that Jesus was on earth. Some of you might have heard of the five-fold ministry. That actually, is uh, the, the work of the apostle is one of the five. But there are five um, that were talked about in Ephesians chapter 4. So you can see here that Christ gave himself the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. For what purpose? To equip the people for works of service and so that the body of Christ may be built up. And what is the outcome and the result? until we reach unity in faith and knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So there you can see the fivefold ministry. So the question that I want to ask us at this time of reflection is, are we developing the gifts that God has placed in one another? Are we developing the gifts that, we, uh, that God has been placed in one another? including your own gift. Do you know the gift that God has, been, uh, has placed in you? Those were the fivefold ministry, but there are other ministries that are talked about in the Bible. The ministry of the bishop, the overseer, the ministry of the deacon, the manager, the ministry of the elder, the spiritual leader, the ministry uh, of the, so the, the spiritual governance. There's so many different ministries that you can be, uh, that you can be part of, but, uh, but you need to know the gift that God has placed in your heart. And you, you are responsible for developing that gift and the gift of the people around you. And then second one is, do we create the space and opportunity for other people to serve? Do we create the space and opportunity for people to serve? Now, this sermon today is going to be our blueprint uh, <clears throat> for the next few months as we prepare ourselves as a community for what God is going to take us into the future. If we 
uh, and you see at the end of this, right, if we do this right, we are going to have the impact that this church is called to have. If we don't do this right, then we will lose an opportunity to have the impact. Okay? This church will go on. It's just a question of is it going to be something that is going to grow and become alive and bear fruit? Or is it just going to continue to be the same as it was before? So it's very critical that we remember these points that are coming up from the, the journey that the disciples themselves took as they left the upper room. So the second one is they raised up and they recognized new leaders. The third one that they did together was that they created clarity of what God was doing in that season. They created clarity of what God was doing in that season. So this comes from Acts chapter 2. And in Acts chapter 2, you know, we see that the Holy Spirit came down and people were able to speak in other tongues, right? The Holy Spirit came, uh, the fire of the people, the, then they were able to speak in other tongues. And it's really important for us to be able to understand what happened at Pentecost, right? Because Pentecost is, was, this is the, the, the moment that is, we, the church celebrates every, and commemorates every year, which is this particular uh, event. And you see, what did Peter do? Peter actually stood up and he said to the crowd, look, that actually when the Spirit was poured out on people, this is not a, um, a not something that is um, to be made fun of. This is because there, you can see in the, the previous passage of Scripture, in verse 13, that um, some people were making fun of them. They said that these people were drunk. So they didn't understand what was going on. And Pentecost was a very important moment because it was the, it represented the time when God's Spirit is poured out that we break, that God is breaking in God's purposes into all of humanity. God was bringing humanity together in understanding despite their differences, their brokenness, their shame, their fear, their distrust. And this was being brought together by the, whole, the work of the Holy Spirit. So they can, people can live in communion with one another, not to be exactly the same, they can be different, but they can understand and relate to one another. That was the, the, one of the experiences of Pentecost. So what did Peter do and, and respond to them? So you see how Peter responded. I want to read to you his response. He said that, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens on, uh, above and signs on the earth below. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So what did, um, so what did Peter do? He stood up and created a clarity that actually what had happened in that moment was the fulfillment of the promise of God given to the prophet Joel. It is not just he himself that, okay, I understand what's going on, right? Because I know what, but Jesus probably told me about the prophet Joel, I read it in the Torah. But we need to, he stood up and helped other people to have clarity about what was going on. So clarity is very, very important. And my reflection questions here for each one of us is, are we helping one another to understand what is going on in our current season through the eyes of God's eyes and heart? And secondly, are we connecting people to the purposes of God? So these are the two things that are really important questions to ask ourselves on. Are we creating clarity of what is God doing in this season? Then the next, the, uh, what happened immediately after this was that Peter then gets up and he is preaching his very first sermon on the back of this passage of scripture. And what did he do? He made the very first altar call. So, we can see that here in verse 37, 
It says, when the people heard this, they were cut to their heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord God will call. And then he said to them, with many other words, he warned them, he pleaded with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized. Uh, about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And it's incredible because what happened here was that uh, Peter stood up and told them to make a commitment. And then after that, told them also as the as the uh, as kind of like a leader here to make sure that we that they save themselves from this corrupt generation to not be conformed in their life in the way that they live to the system of the world but to be transformed by the renewing of their mind and this was a continual theme that was then picked up when we talk about the kingdom of God breaking in right a new alternative community a new way of living and that's why it's now called a holy nation and a royal priesthood these people were going to be known for the difference in the way that they would live their lives then on. So, number four, what happened was that they encouraged the community to make a commitment to align with God's mission. They encouraged the community to make a commitment to align with God's mission. So the question that I'm going to be asking, as firstly to the leaders, is are you encouraging people to be a part of the work of God? Are you encouraging people to be a part of, of, of the work of God? When we give an altar call, it's an opportunity to encourage, right? Um, encourage is the word and encourage. It's to put courage into people, to give people an opportunity to make that commitment so that they can have the courage to do something they would not ordinarily want to do. So they were encouraging people to be a part of the work of God. And then, for uh, if you are sitting here, the question that I have for you is that, are you living for your comfort and convenience? Are you living according to the system of this world? Or are you living according to God's purposes? Are you living according to the system of this world? Are you living according to God's purposes? You know, um, I'm learning this. Um, you know, I've been involved in uh, church leadership for a while. And I don't like to piss people off. So I don't ever ask people to make commitments. I don't ask people, I don't like, like to correct people for the things that they are doing wrong because maybe they won't like me after that, right? And we all want to be liked, especially me because I got approval addiction. You all know that I shared many times already. <laughs> um, and it's, it's very human and very natural. It comes from a place of brokenness, right? My brokenness. But our job when we lean into uh, to God's purposes is to help people to move from their place where they are as, as leaders, to move them and repent. Repent is simply to look, to pause, to consider where you are and be able to turn the other direction. And we can't turn people for, uh, for them. They have to turn themselves. They have to make the decision to repent. What we can do is only to encourage, to create the environment where they are loved, they are supported, we have to trust with them, but we can also speak into their lives so that they can then move into people's, you know, into God's purposes. You know, too often in our lives, what we do in church as leaders is that we go like, okay, la, never mind, I'll leave that person alone, it's okay. Um, then we go and do ourselves, and then we burn out, and then we have to take a sabbatical, you know what I mean? And then the cycle repeats itself, right? It's very unhealthy, uh, psych uh, unhealthy, a cycle of you know of brokenness that we continue to perpetuate. You see, the, the thing is that God's will is not difficult to discern, but it is impossible to follow in the natural. But when we allow the Holy Spirit to fill us, what we cannot do on our own, God does through us. And so I want to be able to encourage you, put courage into you, that if you're not seeing the purposes of God manifested in your life, one, Align yourself to the mission and purposes of God. And two, allow the Holy Spirit to work in and through you so that what you can't do in the natural, you can do by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through you. So number four, 
They encourage the community to make a commitment to align with God's mission. And finally, number five, they lift out their call as a missional community. They lift out their call as a missional community. And we see this in this beautiful passage of scripture in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And it says here, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had in need. Every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all of the people. And God added to the number of them daily that were being saved. So here we see them connecting what they believed in, in terms of in the way that they lived. They were not aligned to the system of the world anymore, not their own comfort and convenience, not their own wealth, uh, well-being, but they brought everything together, they lived communally, they poured out and, made, uh, and, and met needs. So the question that I had with each one of us as we discern over the next few months together is how do you align this, the work of this church, this community, with the mission of God? What does God want to do in and through GSKL in this season? What does God want us to be able to become as a community, as a people? And then so secondly, how do you live out the reality of Pentecost through this community? How we live out the reality of Pentecost? Pentecost, remember we looked at it, was all about being able to bring unity amidst the diversity, being able to be inclusive of different languages, um, of different cultures, being able to celebrate diversity. We see this, all of this uh, action happening at Pentecost. That is the work of the Spirit. When the Spirit comes, it gathers people together, doesn't lose people's distinctiveness, but celebrates inclusivity and diversity. So how do we live out this reality of Pentecost in and through this mission that we have as a community? How do we align the work of GSKL and all those involved in it to be a missional community? To role model what this new kingdom living, kingdom culture, which we like to use this word very often here, is going to look like, right? How do we role model this? How do we show the world what it looks like? The church is called to be the light upon the hill, a role model that everybody else looking in can see what does it look like when love and justice operate as the operating system of this community. How does this community become the body of, G uh, of Christ, right? The church is Christ's body, the hands and the feet of Jesus. Jesus made real into the world. I want to um, just share with you this particular verse of scripture, which is my one of the, um, I think for me, favorite scriptures about describing about the role that the church plays and our relationship with Jesus Christ. It says here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 23 from the message version of scripture that the church is not peripheral to the world. Peripheral means uh, on the sidelines of the world. The world is actually peripheral to the church. It's the church is the center of of everything because the church is Christ's body in which Jesus speaks and acts and by which God fills everything with the presence of God's Spirit. So, the, you know, uh, we're called to be salt and light. The church is called to be um, a, a beacon where people can look to to be able to role model what the alternate way of living looks like and thereby be ministering to other people, but also encourage other people to bring in the kingdom of God to where they are as well. Wherever there is a church, the role of the church is to be this, the salt and the light, is to be the hands and the feet of Christ. It is to be Jesus made real in the world. And if you think about it, all the way back to the first disciples, the first church that we just read about, the very long two passages of Acts chapter 1 and 2, we will know that this is something that because of their faithfulness that all of us are here. If they didn't do that and they weren't faithful with that, we would not be sitting in these chairs today. 
maybe God will raise somebody else, but you know, it's on the back of that that the church began, the first church began, the church grew, and we can be all here together. It was a faithfulness of that community, and that's why we have a role model to follow the witness of the early church towards God's mission. So, as GSKL completes our time here, and it's time to leave the upper room. God is pouring out God's Spirit upon us, not so that we can be kept for ourselves, so that we can be poured out into the world. And over the next few months, where we go into the temporary home, God is calling us to do these five things. To meet as a community, to pray and discern. To raise up and to recognize new leaders. To create clarity of what God is doing in this season. To encourage the community to make a commitment to align with God's mission and to live out our call as a missional community. To the degree that we can have transformation of our lives and the transformation of the way that we live in the, as a community will be the degree of impact that we will have. The degree of transformation that we have into the image of Christ and Christ's mission is the degree that we will have in terms of our impact as GSKL. The early church only grew to the impact that they had because they were willing to let go of what they were familiar with. They were willing to venture out to places where maybe you know, it's completely new areas, new countries, new cities, new models, new things, raising up new people that they have not worked with. They were only able to grow to the impact that they had because they were discerning what God was calling their community to do at that time. They were only able to have the impact that they had because they gave themselves permission to dream, to prophesy, to think dream dreams and to see visions of what things can be and not just look at what was in their hands at the moment. And then when they realized that they could they had these dreams and they looked around at the hands of the people around them with the heart of the people around them, guess what? The dream became a reality because people had a new way of living and shared the resources to make that dream happen. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and in a moment we're going to all sing together um, here I bow but today I want us to be able to spend some time because it begins in this upper room when the Holy Spirit is going to fill each and every one of us and prepare us to leave this place so can I just ask us all to just rise for a moment and as we're singing the song here I bow what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be first asking the leaders uh, to come forward, not the ones who are playing the, um, the instruments, of course, but you know the two of the, 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 the important leaders are playing the instruments here, but there are still other leaders in the room. But I want the leaders in the room to come forward when I call you all forward. And I'm going to do something that we're going to prepare ourselves to leave this place because this is our last time here. I'm going to be anointing you with oil. And then what I want to do is that the, the anointing of the oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit infilling you. And what I want you to then do is to take the oil and then anoint the people around you. So that when we leave, we leave together as a single anointed community. So let's just spend some time quieting our hearts Maybe one of the points resonated with you here this afternoon. And God is speaking into your heart about that. Today is a day of preparation. There's no more time limit already. Today is the last day of preparation. We are going after this. <laughs> We're literally going to back up this hall right after service. So this is the last moment that we have an opportunity to allow the Holy Spirit to just be poured out upon us. 
So can I invite you, you know, each one of us to just close our eyes, just do what you need to do to posture yourself to receive the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's to open up your hands. Maybe it's to lift up your arms. Maybe it's to bow down. Maybe it's to just quieten your spirit and just focus on the Lord. And say, come Lord Jesus, have your way in my life. Have your way in the life of GSKL.